Hello and welcome to the Mark Groves Podcast. So today's guest needs no introduction, but allow me to reintroduce Terry Cole, who is a psychotherapist, an absolute truth teller, like words cut right to the soul and liberate us. I honestly couldn't be more excited to be able to share her words with you today. This is a reboot. This is one of the most popular episodes that has ever aired on my podcast, and for very good reason. It is called The Disease to Please. It's on the subject of codependency. And this subject itself, we often don't even know that we're codependent. And as Terry talks about, we are often high-functioning codependents. We have no clue that we're giving away our power, our energy, and all these different things because it's so normalized. And that really, for me, has been one of the most freeing things about learning about codependency is recognizing these places where I'm stuck, where I, where I give myself away, where I self-abandon, where I people-please, where I'm afraid to get negative feedback, but at the cost of turning down my voice, my truth, whatever that might be. And I'm sure that when you look at your own life, you might see where you silence yourself or where you haven't pursued your passions or your dreams or you're afraid to rock the boat or you really live in this state of wanting to take care of and please other people. You're about to have your world rocked because there's a reason this is one of the most popular episodes. And so I'm so honored to have had the experience of creating a course with Terry Cole called Crushing Codependency. And we are going to be running the course live again with live calls. And if you want to find out more and sign up, you go to createthelove.com slash codependency. So createthelove.com slash C-O-D-E-P-E-N-D-E-N-C-Y. Go there to sign up, check it out. And we start on April 6th and there's going to be four live calls and it's just going to be incredible. So wherever you listen to this episode, one way that you can really support the podcast is by subscribing to it so you don't miss any and also giving it a five-star review and a written review. And of course, if this really resonates with you, sharing this episode with the people you love and the people who follow you on social and make sure you tag me. And so without further ado, here is the codependency master blaster, Terry Cole. Welcome back to another episode of the Mark Groves podcast, where we are also welcoming back a very popular guest and one of my favorite humans. I mean, anyone who tells it like it is, you know, and tells the truth to me, too, about how I am is a good friend to have and a good human to have, especially on a podcast about love and relationships. So Terry Cole, welcome back. Why, thanks, Mark Groves. I'm so excited to be back. Well, you know, the first time we chatted, we didn't know each other yet. So it was sort of like an, not an awkward first date, but it was like, we didn't get to know, we were like in the conversation, getting to know each other. And then I remember we talked for like an hour after we recorded and we was like, shit, we should have just done that. Right. We were like, all the juice was in that. <laughs> right. And then like, we touched on the subject of codependency. And I know for you and I, that subject is like very impassioned. It, it, and for everyone listening, you know, they might think like, oh, this subject doesn't apply to me. Mm -hmm. But what would you say to such a brave statement? Well, here's the thing. I, why I write about, talk about, lecture about, teach about codependency so much is because it is so misunderstood that I would say you're wrong if you think it doesn't apply to you. Because I'm going to guess, and that's an educated guess, 96% of you are between moderately and highly codependent. And I'm going to tell you why people don't understand it. Actually, to the point that I created a new moniker, basically, I created a new word or phrase because the women in my crew, mainly women, probably 20% men, 80% women, super high functioning, get it done. They're running the world type women who on the home front, on the business front, they're just doing it all. And they're like, I don't depend on any one person. Like I'm not codependent. So the new name is high functioning codependency. Oh, I like this. Right. Because when we think about codependency, a lot of us, if you're over the age of, I don't know, 30, you might be familiar with codependent no more. Yeah. All right, this is an amazing book written decades ago by Melody Beatty, which still holds up and she's revised it many times. 
But there is a reality from her own experience that she talks so much about codependency as it relates to being involved with an addict of some kind. Mm, that it is a good that you are codependent as in sort of like enmeshed or trying to rescue someone like that is the model is like it's because it's based on Al-Anon, her work, right? Mm-hmm. Like, which for people listening, Al-Anon is for people who are in relationship to ad- addicts. Yes. Right. It is based on that, isn't it? It Well, it is. There's there's so much of it. I don't know if she based the text originally yeah. on it, but when you think about, you know, we talk about enablers. So for her, this is kind of like means the same as codependency. Mm-hmm. And in my estimation, um, I don't think that that's necessarily true. And I don't think you need to be involved with an addict to act in a codependent way. So I think we should have a working definition of codependency. So what do you say it is? I think for me, I would say that it is where the object of our you know, reading, our desire to fix someone, it is, uh, it's someone else. Like it's the work that we are doing is about other people. We might, I love that you said high functioning could have been, I've never thought of that term, but it right away makes me think that it also could be the and I guess this is operating in the other definition too, is that we have a, we can, we don't know how to be the focus of love or receive love, that our work is outward more so. Is that fair? Yeah, I think that that is correct. So we are Ooh, overly focused. I feel good about that. Right on, you should, you should. We're overly focused on the other person, but there's more to it than that. Because if the way that I would describe it is being overly invested in the feeling state the decisions, right, the choices, um, and the outcomes of the people in our life. And it doesn't just have to be a romantic relationship. I find that the women in my crew and my own life before I had 7,000 years of therapy was that I could be codependently attached to anybody, like literally anyone. I could be overly invested in feeling someone says, oh, hey, you know, I'm looking for a new job. I don't like my job. Literally the next day, I'd be like doing a search. I'm like, I know a person who works here. I'm I'm connecting you. If you want me to take a look at your resume, I will. You know, I know there's a good stop. So there's also the. I know. <laughs> I've never done this myself. What are oh, you talking about? Uh-huh. I feel attacked <laughs> right now. <laughs> I'm going to bend with gummy bears sometimes, you know, like I get it. I get it. Yes. But why don't we want to be? So, so the real question is, what is the cost for being overly invested in the feeling state, the decisions, the outcome of others? A, you don't have enough bandwidth to be interested in that for yourself. So your whole life is sort of living for other people. Yeah, so that's depleted, exhausted. You do. But the thing that people don't understand about high-functioning codependency is that it is a covert bid for uh, control. So are you saying, so when I think about that in the the idea of like people who are the nice person or the person, you know, nice guy, quote unquote, is sort of like the colloquial words we know. But so you're saying that they are through their behaviors, they are creating covert contracts that are passively controlling things and in a way sort of manipulating. Oh, yeah, not in a way, straight up straight up manipulation but a lot of times this is unconscious so so it isn't like saying if you behave in this way that you you know you you masterminded some nefarious plan to control others it's all about fear yeah it's all about lack it's all about really think about fear now what if you grew up in a chaotic system an alcoholic system an addicted system a system filled with neglect or even an authoritarian system you were trained to see what other people need and be like how can i get that to you it's it's never about what you need how your feelings are you learn because as kids we're so incredibly adaptive no one needs mm-hmm. to teach you this right this is just like life school we just learn it attunement yeah yeah it, that's exactly what it is and you only need to like stick your hand in that fire of someone being mad at you, yelling at you, hitting you, um, screaming at you, icing you out, ignoring you. You don't need to do that often as a child to understand, figure out the ways to avoid 
having that experience. So that is an adaptive response because how amazing are our brains and our emotional makeup that we're like, oh, how do I not get hurt? Okay, Mm. this is how I not get hurt. So that adaptive functioning, what happens in adult relationships becomes maladaptive. Yeah, the way that we protected ourselves and fit in the family system becomes the way that we actually create walls to love and vulnerability and accessibility. And it's amazing because we don't, till we're having conversations like this and and doing this on a larger scale, because it's not like when you go to school, they're like, hey, listen, we're going to teach you how to solve for X, but you will never know how to solve a conflict with your ex or your partner. <laughs> and so it's so fascinating that like, we don't know these are maladaptive or dysfunctional till we feel like we, especially if we're a high functioning codependent, as you're saying, where we feel like we're an island that no one can really access us, but we are constantly striving to get access, but only on the condition that they don't, like that it's not about us, which is so, because then we feel starved for connection. Right, but the thing is, it's it's such a, um, what's the word? It's like this crazy juxtaposition or mm-hmm. um, it doesn't go together because what we're seeking is not happening because of what we're doing. Yeah, it's like we're creating the thing we fear most. Right. Constantly, and, just a cycle. Well, constantly, and it's all about self-abandonment as well. Mm-hmm. And so what do you think develops from this process? Well, A, the loneliness that you basically described, you're an island because nobody really knows you. But it's more than that. It's like eventually, because you know, women especially, in particular, men too, but you know, I'm, I more know the female experience, you could do this for decades, but there comes a point where you just pivot and you're just bitter. Like you you get on this Mm self-sacrificing, you know, I I put up something the other day and I said, as women were trained and, and we're basically rewarded for being self-sacrificing, self-abandoning, right? Like we're rewarded for that. People are like, oh, she's so giving. She's so nice. And you're like, she's so not herself. So (laughs) yeah, right. That's what's really happening. You don't even know Betty who you're saying is so nice and she'll give you the shirt off her back. Well, why, why would Betty do that? She'll give anyone the shirt off her back. That's supposed to be something that is aspirational. And I'm like, Mm -hmm. what's wrong with Betty? Isn't she cold? Why is she giving her shirt? To <laughs> she adults? Yeah. Well, it's it, it, when I think of that model of like patriarchy of this breadwinner family, all those things, you're right. It's, it's rewarding this self-abandonment, rewarding this caretaking, rewarding. Interesting from when I think in the heteronormative sense of that relationship, the male is celebrated for being a low functioning, for being emotionally unavailable because there's a constant pursuit of the male. And I think in some way, I, I, I would imagine both people coexist with a belief that there's something inherently wrong with them, especially the, um, no, not especially, but both, but the, for the male partner in that case, that they can never communicate well, that they don't know how to meet their partner's needs. Meanwhile, like in that codependent space, that need is constantly pivoting anyways. You know, I feel like you start to play whack-a-mole because the point is never to actually get to win because the cycle of the relationship is based on this pursuit pattern, like you were saying, this feeling of self-abandonment, this feeling of, because you said that we not only feel lonely, but I, I, that we are perpetuating this inner story that no one loves me, no one chooses me, no one focuses on me. Right. No one yeah. does for me. No one does for me. And you're like, right, because you never let anyone do for you mm. because you're too busy auto accommodating for the your hair salon person who's massaging your head right now like anybody goes above what it is and and this is from you know the childhood experience of trying to you just don't want to be the target or you don't know how to because i came more from a family system of never talking about anything so in my, in my life, like if it was good, sure. But even then I probably, I think to my father, maybe I think I spoke a hundred words before my parents got divorced when I was 13, like maybe a hundred and that might be exaggerating oh. a little bit. So imagine what is that d- develop? What, what happens? Well, all you want to do is cause my father, if he ever did talk, there was a problem. If I heard his voice, I'd be like, 
what's wrong? <laughs> Why is yeah. he talking? What, what do we do? And so you learn to be like, how do I either for me over function to the point where I, I'm above reproach because I'll be so much more successful than any person in this family ever was. Like I will just, that's how I will avoid what is really happening here. But you never learn how to actually have a conversation about things that are difficult or to try to negotiate for your own needs or to tell someone no or to say that there's a problem. And of course, through therapy, obviously, duh, I couldn't be doing this if I didn't figure it out. But yeah. it took years of therapy yeah. to figure it out. And now a master of the conflict resolution. Indeed. Writing a book on boundaries as we speak. Boundary box. I'm so excited for your book that's coming out. Me too. Not till 2021 though, but still. Hey, you know what? Long period of excitement. The build up, it's perfect. The tension, I mean, it's perfect. Delicious. Well, in this, so for people listening, because yeah. I love that we're sort of, there's really not a way of the model of relationship that we've inherited and observed, you know, because evolutionarily self-abandonment was how a tribe thrived. And then we have often gone to this like overly independent, but we're still in a state of insecurity in our connections. And so for people listening, and they might be going like, yeah, okay, how do I, because if you are a woman or a man, and or anything in between, and you wake up within your relationship at 45 or 52, and you're like bitter and resentful, and you blame your partner for all these ways you abandon yourself, where is the step of like, because I meet and see that everywhere. Mm -hmm. And then we're like stuck in this prison of a relationship that we created the agreements over because we thought that's what we're supposed to do. No small task, by the way, this question. So right. You're yeah. like, can, can you, you just that undo that? all of evolution and then maybe just by the end of this podcast, we'll all be good. Sure. No problem. <laughs> well, well, first of all, I wanted to say something about what you said before, and then I will talk about first steps or how can you start to turn the ship around. Mm -hmm. And And for anyone who's listening... Before I talk about turning the ship around, I want you to get clear. I'm just going to give you 10 quick points of things that you may do or feel the way that you may be being in the world that would fall into the category of codependency. Okay, so, perfect. Let's do 10 things. I hate to, that I might have to check some things when I listen. <laughs> Feeling responsible for solving the problems of other people. We know that. <laughs> Feeling used and unappreciated for all that you do do. Um, automatically offering advice to others, whether they've asked you or not, um, expecting others to do what you say. So you have the friend who's like a basket case and you're always like, oh my God, so I made a connection for you and I did this and whatever. And then she's never going to, you know, follow through because she's not. And then you're like, I don't get Betty. Like she was in pain and I told her what to do. And then she didn't do it. Like, mm -hmm. feeling unappreciated because they don't ever listen to what you do, even though you're constantly telling them, even though they never asked you. Uh, taking things personally and personalize, personalizing the problems of other people in your life. So you have someone who has an issue. That issue literally to you feels like it is your problem. You get into problem solving mode immediately. Feeling like a victim. Number six, trying to please others in order to obtain their love and acceptance. So basically, as I would call it, having the disease to please. Mm -hmm. um, fearing rejection. Because that really is a core, a foundational core element of being codependent. Now, <clears throat> if you're a high-functioning codependent, you might not feel that way about every person, every situation. Maybe you can masterfully negotiate your work situation. So you're not really fearing rejection. But I find a lot of times with the women who've been in my practice over the last 22 years who are super high-functioning, they did what I did which is that you just work to the point that you, you don't worry about being rejected because everyone loves you because every, mm. because you're not going to fail because you would rather jump off a bridge than fail. So it's almost like I, I used to think that my own ambition, I was like, this is amazing. It's just how I am. I'm just ambitious like that <laughs> until I had a couple of years of therapy and I was like, Oh, I imagined I was running towards my goals, like just, yes, play the music. Here I wind, go. Wind machine. All yes. Things. Yeah. The hair was happening. <laughs> but I woke up to realize I was actually running away from something. And that something was fear. 
you know, fear of rejection, fear of failure, fear of whatever. So the survival strategy there being, or the coping mechanism, as you were talking about in childhood, being like high achieve so that when I am acknowledged, it's about high achievement and not about the negative connections that I've established. When my dad speaks bad at things, it's something bad's happening. So then as an adult, when you're saying this, um, this high achievement becomes the, our identity course. I'm a high achiever. I'm an independent woman or man or whatever. But I, I see that narrative a lot in, in that space. I was just in New York. So you hear that a lot. Mm -hmm. And I'm an independent person. And then I achieve, achieve, achieve. But really, the distraction of the high achievement is from stillness and presence to feelings that we experienced as a kid. And then we still experience like this. I And then maybe the narrative that joins that is there's no available people in New York. And I'm like, I'm not even that good at math. And there's like 9 million people. <laughs> like the, you don't need a million to validate your belief. You just need one, mm -hmm. you know? So is that... Is that an accurate sort of representation? Yes, I think that it's it's we use many things. So some people will use addiction, like like we numb our feelings many ways. Mm -hmm. But for the high achieving woman who is the person who's attracted to the work that I do most of the time, it's the you you can't be as you said because then you might feel the feelings you don't want to feel. You don't have the skills to express yourself or to work through the problems to admit that the past is still impacting your present. It's like, I can't tell you how many women have sat on my couch when I had an active uh, practice and been like, listen, I don't want to talk about my parents. Like that's 30 <laughs> years ago is like uh -huh. fine. Like they did the best they could. I feel like I, I can't blame my parents. And I'm like, okay, dude, uh, we're not blaming your parents, <laughs> but we got to find the origin of the injuries. Mm. How we have to connect the dots backwards to there is like perpetrator zero or situation zero, just like there is with some pandemic, right? Where yeah. you go back and you got to go, oh, now I see why every boss I had was like my punitive father. I get it. I was repeating mm -hmm. something because I was still in pain or that injury was still charged in some way. So in the high so since we're in this model of like high achiever powerful because this is the sort of like a rebellion slash result of this the feminist movement that then rejects the patriarchy and then goes to this other extreme of independence and i'm might not be using the right word in the right order so people listening if you're triggered stay with me so in that high achievement identity if we then have to turn towards the fallibility of ourselves, the way we haven't shown up for ourselves, our codependent nature, our childhood not being perfect or just not wanting to look at it or the pain that occurred, we are avoiding the shame of the unworthiness then being triggered. Is that right? Mm -hmm. So inherent in the identity is an inability to even look at that thing because it would then, the high achiever perfectionist would sure. then be imperfect. Right. So how can they, it, it's almost like, well, if I do this, what happens to this false self that I've spent so long erecting Oof. and perfecting? Like that shit took a long time, right? So, yeah, I've been building this indestructible model for ages. I wash <laughs> right. it down with martinis. What's happening uh, here? Right. And I don't, I don't identify with being weak, quote unquote, with being needy, quote unquote, with all of these things, but it's like trying to cut off a part of our humanness because we're all all of those things. Yeah. We're weak, we're needy, we're strong, we're independent, we're everything. Hold on, before we continue, I'm gonna get the last two. Oh shit, ten. we haven't People even hit will remember. Those. I know. I'm like squirrel. Let's talk. About it. Okay, sorry. <laughs> Number nine yeah. is using manipulation, guilt, and shame to get what you want. So again, as I said before, codependency is actually its own covert bid for power and control because we want to control things so things don't get chaotic. We can't stand the chaos of other people's lives. And so we don't even think about it. We are the auto advice givers. We are just doing it. I number 10, making excuses for the bad behavior of others. And trust me, I could have had like 30 points, but I figured I don't want to spend the whole time talking about points. So, I mean, if you, if you nodded your head to more than half of those, yeah. And you did. 
So I'm yeah. looking in your house. And, <laughs> and, I know and you, you did. did. I can't even see your face. The first one you said, I was like, yep. Okay. Well, it's, this is a tough start. <laughs> uh, okay. So I want to understand or and discuss this idea that, okay, so we have high achieving, because I see this all the time. There's a question I get a lot. We have this high achieving female who is like, I can't find a man who is okay with my level of success and power. And what I at least find often lives in that is that's sometimes true, of course, because men have to re, they have to find their own value in a different way than being a provider you know, then being the breadwinner. And so there's a humility that's required to reorganize what masculinity and actually being a man means. And then also in that, though, is a giant wall. That is, I can't find someone, but I feel like what you're talking about previously is that identity that is celebrated also in the, in the, the world, especially in places like New York, it's just more explicit. Mm-hmm. In that, so when you get that, because you were saying your clients are very often that type of client, where is, because I there's probably a lot of gray in all of that, but when you hear that type of thing, what comes up for you? Well, I mean, we always look at what's called secondary gain. So it's basically, what is the unobvious gain for staying stuck in that limiting belief? So if you say, there's no good men in New York, Everyone is taken la, 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 or gay or whatever it is that, that people say to say why they, they don't meet anyone. If I say that in the questions to reveal secondary gain, I've just come up with some easy ones because conceptually you're kind of like, what is that? So you ask yourself, what do I get to not feel, not face and not experience by staying stuck in this limiting belief, right? What do I get to not feel? not face and not experience by, and we'll take this example, continuing to believe that all the good ones are taken. Mm. Well, we could guess that you get to not be vulnerable. You get to not try and fail. You get to not have to learn new skills to be in a relationship. You get to not have your worst fear confirmed that you are unlovable. Mm, amen. I was like, oh. <laughs> I hope that if you're listening to this and this resonates in some way, that you turn towards it with courageous vulnerability because in that is not the disempowerment of an empowered female or independent person. It actually makes us more empowered to be emotionally integrated. It makes you a badass to like actually pursue everything you want, not just pockets of success, you know, not just pockets of celebration. Like that, I feel like a lot of people are gonna be like, that Terry Cole, I love her and sometimes. <laughs> but it's also about authenticity, right? Because here's the thing with being codependent. So much of the time, we put ourselves last to a degree, right? Because we're so busy making sure we're running the world, right? We've got all sides of every street clean rather than just being concerned with our own side of the street. And what ends up happening in that process is that you don't get your needs met right? How, how does it feel to not be known? So you're, you're not being authentic because when someone says, Hey, I heard you're moving. I can help you. I mean, I can't tell you how many times in my own young life, especially in my twenties, I'd be like, no, I got, I'm good. I'm good. It's all good. Like never someone wanting to do something. I couldn't even stand it. One of my really close friends is such a crazy codependent. She's better now, but crazy where we would travel together. She's out of her mind. She would take her suitcase her huge bag, and then try to grab my bag. I'm like, psycho, <laughs> I can carry my own bag. What is wrong with you? She's like, I got it. Um, and we ended, we used to have like bras. I'd be like, Lara, I'm not one of your fucking clients. I don't know what you're thinking. Stop giving me suggestions I'm not asking you for. I don't, I am not a problem for you to fix. Uh, if you're my friend, you need to hang with the pain that I'm in. I'm the only one who can solve this, not you. And that's the hard truth for high functioning and low functioning codependency is that we, there's this illusion of controlling, but it is an illusion. And the truth is that 
dude, we can barely manage our own emotional lives, oh, yeah. family lives, work lives, right? It's it's a lot on your plate. If you're like, hey, I want to become evolved. I want to understand how I'm blocking my ability to create real, sustainable, vibrant love mm. in my life. Or that I'm phoning in. Maybe, maybe you're married and maybe you're phoning it in. Maybe your husband or your wife, they don't know you. And you're so used to being not known that you're like, it's fine. It's everything is compartmentalized in a mm-hmm. box. But really think about what we're here to do, which is basically be known, love deeply, be authentic. So the reality is if you never let the people in your life authentically know you, they cannot ever authentically love you. So you may have it all. I have so many women who come in, they've got the kids, finances are on track. They got the nice husband. They live in Darien. Everything is fine. (laughs) But is it fine? And they're like, I feel so guilty. But is this all there is? Mm -hmm. Like, I just have to ask, like, literally, is this it? So you could feel alone in your life. Because you're so busy being like, I'm checking the boxes feverishly. (laughs) But then what? Mm. So it matters. It really does matter. I mean, it's the most important thing to cure this disease to please. Mm, That is so. Sorry, go on. No, go ahead. I was going to say, I actually have just the thing, but go ahead. (laughs) What's the thing? Well, I'm doing something. In January, based on everything that we're talking about, about um, it's called the More Love Meditation Experience, and it's a 10-day experience, and you don't have to be a meditator to do it, but I've taken all of these, this wisdom that we're talking about right now, I've taken each like the top 10 gems of wisdom, the things that I've seen in the past 22 years that women have the most problems with or the biggest blocks to creating this durable, but like vibrant, juicy love. It's it's not just durable because there's a lot of duty that goes along with many people in their relationships, but something that actually creates enthusiasm. Yeah. Right. That's exciting. So anyway, I'm doing a 10 day thing. Um, it starts on January 13th, I believe. And, but we have a, I'm, I'm letting your people now we're charging people $10 to participate. Cause I feel like it's good to have some skin in the game, but since your people are special and so are you, Ha, I love that. You hear that, people? You are special. It's true. And, you, and you're and you also already on the love vibe because you're listening to this podcast and you clearly are interested in this. So we have a special code that you can put in. And we have actually have a special um, URL as well. So it's just terrycole.com forward slash love MG for Mark Groves. And that's also the code. So if you find yourself you know, getting to the link somehow. And you're like, I don't know, there'll be a place where you can put in a coupon code and it'll be free for you to do. So we're doing it for five days. And then we take the weekend off so people can catch up. We're going to be talking about it, like what's coming up for you. And then we'll do the last five days. Oh, that's sweet. And for people listening, Terry spells her name dot com slash love MG. Is that right? Yes. Ooh, thank you for that. $10 off everybody, just because you listen to this. Uh, and remember, just because you get it for free doesn't mean you should not finish it. That, like one of the first parts of all the things I teach is self-sabotage. Not finishing things is a classic way to not learn the truth that you're afraid of. Yes. And I made it soft because it's Good. you're listening to this guided meditation and that's what's required of you. But you also have a daily, it's a small but very powerful focus, like a daily focus that you'll be thinking about. And you would, your mind would be blown as to how much transformation can happen simply by harnessing the power of your own intention. I love that. And I, this is an opportunity for us to just like continue to dive deep and learn and build relational awareness of, because, you know, we might be listening to this and be further on our track of reading books about stuff or, you know, maybe Eckhart Tolle or whatever is your jam. But you also might be like just listening to this for the first time and being like, fuck me, I'm codependent. This is bullshit. I thought I was independent and empowered. And that's the first part is like the the first part of just the glitch of cognitive dissonance Mm. between what I thought I was doing and what I'm actually doing. 
that gap is such a gift, but that gap is also the space that causes us to swipe on Instagram and drink a lot and smoke weed and do all the things to distract us from the dissonance of responsibility to show up for ourselves. Yeah. And, and also getting clear that so much of the time we say we want things, you know, but this is an opportunity for you to actually get something. And I made it so, so easy. It's so gentle, but I promise you, if you put your heart into it, it's 10 days. So if I told you in 10 days, you could transform something that's been creating pain for you for a lifetime, would you do it? You know, people, my clients used to say to me, because I would make all of my therapy clients meditate. I'm a meditation teacher. I have a bunch of CDs out and they would be like, I don't have time. I just can't do it. And I would always say, Hey, if, let me ask you a question. If at the end of 30 days, if I made you an offer and I said, if you meditate every day for 10 minutes and I'm giving you the meditation, like you don't even have to like sit with your thoughts because I'll be talking at the end of 30 days. If I promised that I would give you $5 million in cash, I don't know. Do you think you could do 30 days of meditating? I mean, I, I would do it. <laughs> well, <laughs> everyone would do it. Yeah, so of course. What we're really looking at is what is your motivation? Because 2020 could literally be your year of real epic love, even if you're in a relationship. So this isn't just for single people. This is it. All of my work starts with creating an amazing relationship with yourself. But that includes knowing yourself, understanding why you are the way you are. Stop judging. My God, stop being so mean to yourself. Like with curiosity, as Deepak Chopra would say, right? The highest thing that we can do is become the observer without judgment. Get curious, like, huh, well, that is interesting that the last five girlfriends I've had or boyfriends I've had have all been actually unavailable. Mm -hmm. I wonder why that is. Well, must be them. <laughs> must be. Of, of course, it's them. Yeah. It's <laughs> so, just fate. What are you talking about, Terry? This is. It's just fate. <laughs> <laughs> Got to be in the right place at the right time because you know people are just unlucky in love. I'm like, no, it it you know why? Because it's not magic; it's psychology. Right, it's patterns. Make a different yeah. choice, get a different life. And there you go. It, it literally is that simple. It's just the complexities of changing a pattern create so much fear, you know. Because we're even cycles of uh, certain pain are still certain. And what a what a gift of adulting it is to take a leap towards something you've never done, to have a conversation you've never had, to see yourself in a way, maybe with some compassion for, you know, the kid in us. Yeah. And maybe to do it in, in a sacred space. Mm. So I think so much of the time we don't do it because it's, we already feel alone and you're like, I don't know where to start, but what if someone else knew where to start? Right. Wait, we have to go back to though. Cause I promised we would. I said we would go back to turning the ship around. If you're in a relationship. Nice memory, by the way. Thank you for going back to that. Well, I just know people are going to be like, um, hi, she said she was going to turn the ship around and give <laughs> yeah. me something to do, but she didn't. You just turned it around. Perfect. We're turning it. That's correct. But what were we turning the ship around from? If you find out you're codependent and you're in a long-term relationship, how do you start to change that dance? Was yeah. That question? Yeah. Well, before we do anything, First of all, we have to just get on board together. I'm a psychotherapist. I've been doing this for over two decades. Small steps equal massive transformation. So much of the time when we think about these things like changing something, we're like, oh my God, I need to know everything. I have to know the exact words and I need to, and they're going to, and I can't, and it's too much. I mean, how many of you have not gotten out of relationships because you're like, fuck, we own something together, or I'm so close with his sister or her sister, or whatever. Like we have all these <laughs> stories of like uh, why we can't change something. And so much of the time we'll say, no, I know them, you know, they're not going to change. And I'm like, mm -hmm. okay, here's the thing. We don't care. We don't care that they're not going to change because your healing comes from you having the courage to stand up and do something different for you. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't have to look like some crazy confrontation. Everything I teach is like ease and grace. We can do it with love if it's appropriate or not, if it's not. Yeah. So before we even get into what you can do to turn the ship around, I want you to know that whatever you realize, maybe just from listening to this podcast, that does not require you to take action. 
right? So, so much of the time in my practice, there would be this code language that women would talk to me and then they would say, I'm so confused. I'm really torn. And the moment someone started saying those words, I would be like, oh yeah, she knows what she has to do. She just doesn't know how to do it. Oh, amen. That is so true that we, the, the I'm torn and confused is the delay, the fear, you know, the, the ability to put on hold, which is makes so much sense, you know, indecision is decision, but it's also, you know, we look back after we do something and we say, I wish I would have done it two years ago, but it's like, you weren't ready. You weren't ready. And then you shame the part of you that needed to prepare. Right. And we all need to prepare. Yes. But but if you're saying to yourself, if you're in a situation and you're like, I, I'm confused or I don't know, or I'm torn or what, I just want to give you permission to know what you already know and to really think when it's just you and you and you're looking in the mirror, you know the truth. And that's okay. That doesn't mean you need to do anything today. Just allow yourself, allow the truth to marinate. If something doesn't change, perhaps, then that's a deal breaker for you. Or maybe you already know, I was having this conversation with a friend the other day, and I can always tell intuitively like what's going on. Mm -hmm. She's married, she's got kids, whatever. And she was like, we were catching up and she was telling me this whole long drawn out story of what was going on with her husband. And I could just tell from the way she was, they had some incident happened in, in the summer and she was like, so, you know, I think he's going to get into therapy. And I've been in therapy. And, blah, blah. and I said, can I ask you something? And she said, yeah. And I was like, is it already too late? And she was like, I think that's very possible. Mm. I was like, okay. And even if it is, that doesn't mean you have to leave today or ever if you don't want to. But when we lie to ourselves is when we can literally never effectively problem solve. You could stay. You know, I had clients who would be like, I'm married to a doctor. That was my dream. I hate his guts, but I don't care because I want to be rich. I don't care. I'm like, okay, well, I'm not judging you as long as you have made that deal and that you're okay with the deal that you've made for real. And that woman actually was. And I was like, more power to you, sister. I mean, I can't, I don't need them to want what I want in my own life. Mm. But it's lying to ourselves. And if we're in pain. Hey, if you're not in pain, you don't need to change anything unless you want to. But if there's something that's unsatisfying, or if you're like one of those women I was saying before, who's like, is this all there is? I've been so dutiful. I worked so hard. I've checked all the friggin' boxes. I thought I would feel so different at this point. If you feel that way, then there is something that does need to change because there's definitely more than that. So from the question of, is this all there is? The answer is no, but to get it, you got to be willing to do something different. So for those back to turning the ship around, for those of you in that situation, become an expert on yourself. Mm. The healing of the situation is the healing of self always, because you don't know where it will bring you, but it's just the beginning. It's like, we get so worried about where it might bring us as opposed to seeing that the the beauty is always in, the, you know, the, the juice is always in the journey, that it's who you become on the way to whatever outcome occurs. Exactly. And that's why we say it doesn't matter what the other person does, because us speaking up, telling the truth, drawing a boundary, making a simple request, it isn't to control the other person. It's to get our needs met. If the other person flips out, if the other person, if you're dating someone, this is how you can tell if someone's a psycho early on in the dating situation, is if you push back, if you ask for something, if you say, no, actually, I'd prefer to do something else, or you will see all of that love bombing that they might have been doing to you shift into a different behavior. Mm, yeah. When you have the disease to please, you get so far in before you ever start to push back that you're like, crap, that was 15 years ago, too late now, but it actually isn't. It's never too late. It's never it too is. late. Well, it's never too late for you to become authentic in your life. No, to give birth to all of you and to see that the only reason we experience inauthenticity is because we're taught to be. It's a survival strategy to not be yourself. Yes. But then as an adult, you know, the gift of the space of being an authority on your own life is that you get to create it. You do. And the thing that might blow your mind, for those of you, if you were in that situation we were talking about before with turning around the ship, 
is that we have all of these fear fantasies, so many of them child, Mm -hmm. the child within fear fantasy of how someone's going to respond. And I can't tell you hundreds, thousands at this point of women in my courses, Real Love Revolution and Boundary Bootcamp are my two signature big courses Mm -hmm. where people are like, oh my God, I told my boss I'm not working on weekends. And she was like, fine, good for you. And they were like, (laughs) what? Why did I I could have said this eight years ago and had all those vacation weekends and my own life. Yeah. But, but you, we have to make that happen. So that woman was terrified she was going to get fired. We have these like catastrophic fear fantasies that are not our adult self because we know how life is. You're out there negotiating the world. So when you have this exaggerated, amplified, like, oh my God, someone's going to burst into flames, like they're not going to. But what you did by saying what you said to them, even if they said, I'm sorry, I cannot accommodate you. Yeah. Is you gave them, instead of giving them corrupted data about who you are and what you want and what your preferences are, you gave them solid data, information about who you are. So it isn't, we tell the truth, not because we have to get our way every time, because of what I also find with codependence is that if you're always accommodating other people, you also are not the best at taking a no. Oh, yeah, yeah, right. Like if you don't honor other people's uh, boundaries, you probably get oh, pretty yeah. triggered. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's very personal. You are extremely upset about and you can't believe that Betty isn't going to do that for you when you've done so effing much for her. See how the bitterness comes out? <laughs> you know, all the secret <laughs> contracts you created with Betty. Poor Betty's like, but I thought you were just like bringing me soup because I was sick. Oh, no, Betty, that went in the file cabinet. Yeah, like you're going to be bringing me soup for the rest of your life, just so you know. (laughs) (laughs) Every Wednesday, Betty. (laughs) It's your turn. But And I look, coming back to that idea of as we go through the transformation within relationship, that often we attach fulfillment to the relationship working out as opposed to seeing that fulfillment is never in our relationship status. It can be through it can be increased and you know uh, contributed to through the love with another but it is not living in that experience it is we could find fulfillment from within which just brings fulfillment to the relationship sometimes and sometimes our fulfillment leads us away from the relationship because the other person doesn't want the renegotiation of agreements Exactly. But part of it is when you're a codependent, you have to think about that we're looking for others. Like us helping others is what f- makes us feel valid, makes us feel worthy of something, right? We helped this one and helped that one and helped th- did these things and made sure this person didn't whatever. And it's like, we have to fill up our own bucket. And we hear, you know, we hear these like platitudes or whatever. And you're like, What does that even mean? That means knowing how you feel. That means caring how you feel. When you're codependent and have the disease to please, we prioritize keeping the peace, not upsetting the apple cart above figuring out who we are. And it isn't just revealing, you know what always annoys me when when in this space of like empowerment and self-improvement people are all like you just have to be your true self just just peel back the onions to your authentic self and what i want to say is that's no that's not how it is we work to create who we will become we decide you may naturally be a particular way or maybe you learned you have a downloaded blueprint around relationships that make them you know very combative let's say You don't have to take on that. You can decide you're going to do it differently. But it isn't like just being in therapy and peeling away the layers or taking a bunch of courses will do that. It requires work on our part every day. Who will I step up for in my life? Who will I be? Am I abandoning myself or am I honoring myself? Am I telling the truth even when it's hard as hell? I want to avoid it so bad still. And I've had 35 years of therapy, Mm -hmm. but I don't avoid it, right? I just still want to for a second. And then I go, right, but no, I just, this is the truth. That person, you honor the other person by speaking up for what is. And not to mention when we stay in these messed up 
relationships where it's like this cycle of bad stuff, cycle of abuse, maybe, or just cycle of like badness, let's say, mm -hmm. we are colluding mm -hmm. with the lowest part of that other person instead of inspiring. Like we could hold their higher self in mind. We could get committed to being our higher selves. What are your morals? What are your values? Where Where is your integrity in the whole process? So we have this illusion, like it's like, I want to be nice. I didn't want to tell them that I didn't like the thing because I it wasn't nice. No, you know what? You didn't tell them that you didn't like the thing. And I don't mean do it meanly. Yeah. But what happens is they think you like the thing now. So now they're going to. Now you're going to have to pretend to like that shit for. For. Uh, you like NFL Sunday? No, you don't. <laughs> you liar. You know, but that's as you were saying before, we like create this actor who we fall in love. Our theatrical self falls in love with another theatrical self. And then when we want to become a, our authentic self, we often cave back to the theatrical self. And I love how you said that, that we we often shrink to meet them instead of rising and inviting them to meet us in a risen state, you know, and that's that's where true authentic connection is born. I mean, that's why we feel so unfulfilled and not seen, because as you said earlier, we're not showing ourselves. So we feel unloved and then we blame them when we've never actually even given them the opportunity to love all of us. And, and that is, obviously I say that with compassion because the only reason we don't show them all of us is this belief we're unworthy of it. But in the act of expression is the belief shifting to, I'm worthy of being loved, so I express it rather out, outside of their response to the expression. Because the worthiness doesn't live in their response, it lives in the expression. And I, that, that's such a shift, you know, to be, evolution is I react to the world and I become who you need. And then expansion and awareness is I am me and you respond in a nice way. Like, don't go out just, you know, throwing shade everywhere. Sure. But the thing that you don't realize is that the people in your life, like if you are feeling unfulfilled in a relationship or if you can't, you know, find the right person, there are many other people who are feeling the same way, especially if you're in a relationship. If you're phoning it in, oh, trust me, if that per unless that person is on drugs, they're well aware <laughs> <laughs> Unless they're drinking a lot to numb the truth that they are actually disconnected to. Exactly. Right. It could be. Yeah. And then they, then they might not notice. But if it's someone who's not an addict of any kind, they know already. So why not just figure out yourself what you want and even the small things. And you can start with, speaking of small steps, you can start with very small things. Getting clear about what's working and what's not. Right. And if you're dating, what's working in the dating world and what's not? Who are you attracting? What is happening? Does it go great for three dates and then they ditch you or then you realize they're an idiot or whatever? They're looking, as Mark was saying before, right? You were talking about the patterns, looking for our own behavioral patterns, because that will help us connect the dots backwards to what we are feeling compelled to repeat, even if it is not going to get us what we want. Man, it's such a mind, I can. Swear, I was like, I was not going to swear. It's such a mind fuck when we see that we are repeating painful patterns, like the, for the conscious mind to process, why would I do that? And then for the, the ability to understand that we do that out of the desire to heal it, you know, the desire yeah. to learn a skill set that we were never taught, that mom never said no to dad. So we don't know how to say no. So we repeat it till we learn the thing. Right. But imagine it like it's a little kid who desperately wants a do over and it's like, all right, this time though, it's totally going to be different because, and with no intervention and with no deeper knowledge of yourself, it most likely won't be. So before we go into that, the, whether you're turning the ship around or whether you want to turn your dating life around, it's going in to yourself. And that's exactly what we're going to do in the more love meditation experience, people. 10 days, 10 days to change your goddamn life. This sounds like a beautiful gift. And for you people, it's free. So literally you have no excuse. Oh man. And if you're like, I don't have the time, that means you actually need to make the time. You know, have you seen that meme where it says next time you say, I don't have the time, try saying it's not a priority. <laughs> right. 
<laughs> it's so true. <laughs> it's so true. And then you see the impact of that on other people of like, it's actually not a priority. And you're like, yep. oh shit, that's back. called communicating the truth. <laughs> well, I love this invitation back to truth, this invitation back to discovering who we are and expressing who we are rather than um, this idea of just be you and just be the truth and just, but when you grew up in a home where your the need your needs were other people's needs then we off it's such a beautiful vulnerable journey to say who am i to just begin that inquiry without being like well i should know who i am oh my god no that's the beautiful gift of life is is the discovery of what you like and what you don't like like it's like food it's the same idea of what we want in love and relationship so this is a 10 day opportunity to do some introspection gently to build a guided meditation practice, which let me tell you, is much easier than just going right into the space of nothingness, which is where you are, but that's a whole other conversation. <laughs> but I'm there with you, so you're actually not alone. Yeah, and I mean, I can vouch for the, the fact that Terry is just an incredible teacher and an incredible human. And just, I've resonated with you from day one, the moment I met you, this raw truth that is delivered with compassion. And that, I remember telling you after you gave your talk at Rise Women's Conference, which was epic, just that that is such the thing about you is that you are so gentle with raw truths. And so I want to say thank you. Thank you for delivering this podcast with grace. You know, you always do it with such grace. Oh, thanks for having me. I'm just so excited that we're both into the same stuff and we can help people suffer less and have more joy. I mean, what better than to nerd out with someone else who nerds out on what we love? 